Hey everyone, uh, so uh, this uh, week's videos have been all about the direct causes of the Civil War. Um, so I was thinking the last one I would record would be the last direct cause, which is the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. So this, uh, this lecture is going to be essentially titled, The Union is Broken. So we're going to see Abraham Lincoln elected and secession occur where the southern states leave. So, in 1860, the situation looked grim. Uh, the nation seemed to be heading towards disunion. Uh, no presidential candidate could unite the northerners and the southerners. Uh, the Democratic Party even splits. Uh, so, you have John Breckinridge and you have Stephen Douglas, the two candidates from the Democratic Party. Um, since the only national party is split, this opens the door for a minority party, the new Republican Party, to nominate New York Governor William Seward. Now, before I get into Seward, I want to uh, explain a little bit. Um, the Republicans of the 1850s and 1860s were not, are not the Republicans of today. Um, a lot of their ideals essentially are the same as Democrats today. Um, and the Democrats, a lot of their ideals are the same as Republicans today. So in 150 years, their, uh, their politics have kind of flip-flopped. Um, so the, the Republican Party, they, probably, they all had figured out, William Seward from New York, he's the best candidate. Um, however... Instead, the Republican Party realizes they need a candidate from the Midwest, somewhere like Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania. They need to win those states in order to win the electoral vote. So, Abraham Lincoln from Illinois offers a better chance to win the Electoral College than William Seward from New York does. So... If you were to look at the election in 1856, so this is four years earlier, um, states like Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Illinois were won by Democrats. Republicans won everything north of that, essentially. Um, and in order to win the electoral vote, the Republicans were going to need to pick up those three states. And if they could, they would end up winning the election. So Abraham Lincoln runs a, uh, a campaign all, ab all about free speech, free homes, free territory, protection of American industry, um, a lot of uh, verbiage and words that are appealing to Northerners and scary to Southerners when you hear free speech, free homes, free territory and American industry, you think the North. And the South is sitting there going, well, what about us? So then there's a third party candidate. Uh, so former Whigs and Democrats meet in Baltimore to form a centrist party, a party in the middle. They plan uh, on trying to get a deadlock in the Electoral College and then winning in the congressional vote, just like in 1824 when John Quincy Adams gained the presidency. So the Constitutional Union Party doesn't issue a platform, and it takes no position on slavery. So essentially they're like, we're just going to run. We don't really stand on anything, but elect us. And the man that they put forth was a slaveholder and an industrialist from Kentucky. So they figured, oh, he'll, you know, appeal to everybody. So... In the election in 1860, Lincoln is elected with the smallest margin of votes in American history. Lincoln, uh, in the popular vote, uh, gains 40%. He does not get a majority. In the electoral vote, he gains 59%. He gets every single state in the North. There are many states in the South that don't even have Lincoln on the ballot. So even though you couldn't vote for Lincoln in the South... Lincoln still won the presidency. If you look at this election from the Southern point of view, you're going to be angry. You're going to think, we don't matter. We can elect a guy, they can elect a guy from the North that wants Northern stuff, 
and we can't even make a difference about it. And that's what the South sees after the election of 1860. So a lot of people in the South actually celebrated this because they had been thinking of secession all along. So Lincoln's election is celebrated in uh, cities like Charleston, South Carolina, where um, uh, individuals that are referred to as fire eaters, rem it reminds me of, uh, that term reminds me of death eaters from Harry Potter, but fire eaters who urge the southern states to call for secession conventions to consider withdrawing from the Union. So remember secession back from the nullification crisis when South Carolina wanted to leave the Union because they felt that they were being treated un un unfairly. This is now, again, in South Carolina about 20 years later. So state conventions uh, that are being held in the South they uh, that vote the South out of the Union, um, these people that go to these conventions are 96% slave owners. They are only representing 5% of the South. So this is a very undemocratic process. You know, they're all angry about not being heard, but again, they're doing things in a way that is undemocratic. Remember, democratic is giving a voice to the people. So on December 20th, 1860, the South Carolina Convention not an elected convention. These are just people that went, adopts a resolution of secession. So um, South Carolinian uh, James L. Pettigrew, who was trying to get the Union to stay together, was trying to get uh, South Carolina to stay. He will go on to be actually a Confederate general. He said, South Carolina, oh, South Carolina, it's too small to be a republic on its own, but it's too large to be an insane asylum. Essentially, these guys are crazy. They don't know what they're doing. So you're going to see South Carolina in December. Then you're going to see a whole bunch of other states like Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida in January of 1861. So if you think about that, these are all deep south states that are leaving. And then Texas in February. So... Uh, the southern states are sending politicians up north to try to get the Union, the northern states, just let them go. Uh, Alabama politician William Yancey goes up north to New York City, Syracuse, Boston, to tell the north, just let us go in peace, and we will not free our slaves and let them come north to marry your daughters. So essentially, <laughs> you know, don't be afraid. We're going to hold our slaves. We won't let them come attack your daughters. That's so beyond the point. That's not the issue at hand. Uh, fire eaters continue to use threats of race violence to convince Southerners to support secession and Northerners to, to oppose invading the South. So um, these Southern states that seceded become known as the Confederate States of America. The Confederate states select Jefferson Davis as the president and, and uh, Alexander Stevens as their vice president. Uh, both the Confederate president and VP were chosen by a 50-person convention. Again, they're not elected. So all this stuff that the South is all angry about, and they are being hypocrites. Um, they essentially uh, create a constitution that is like the blueprint for the United States Constitution, except the only difference is slavery is allowed. Um, so disillusion in the South. So the South thinks that one Southern soldier is as good as 10 Northern soldiers. Uh, Mississippi Senator James Chestnut Jr. states, you know, I'm going to go into battle and I'm going to drink all the bloodshed in the upcoming war. So this tells us that we the, we the South think we're going to kick some butt and make it easy. So on April 12th, 1861, we see the first shots of the Civil War fired. The Confederates opened fire on Fort Sumner, South Carolina, when the Union uh, commander refused to surrender. So the Union commander is Robert Anderson, and the Confederate attacker is PGT Beauregard, one of my favorite names from history, Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard. And the interesting thing here is uh, PGT Beauregard was a student of so uh, it is student against teacher. So Robert Anderson has his post at Fort Sumner. He, is, uh, he has declared an oath to defend it. The South says, yeah, um, give that to us. And the U.S. military says no. So opens fire. 
After 34 hours of bombardment, Union forces inside the Fort Sumter surrender. Uh, the only casualty was a Confederate horse. So the bloodiest war in history starts with no casualties. So uh, one of my favorite Civil War quotes, it was a bloodless beginning to the bloodiest war in American history. You're going to see 600,000 Americans die in this fight for the Union. Um, the thing that, uh, you know, just makes me think that the South's hypocrites here. And to this day, they refer to the uh, Civil War as the War of, a Northern, of Northern Aggression. And to that I always say, who fired the first shot at Fort... Speaking of shots, somebody's just shooting up on the hill. Um, who fired the first shot at Fort Sumner? It was the South. They fired on that fort on a U.S. military installation. So that's, you know, it's not a war of northern aggression. It's a war of the South trying to break the Union apart. And after this battle at Fort Sumter, you're going to see Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas leave the Union as well. And, oh, and sorry, North Carolina as well. And this is going to push us into civil war. And that will be discussed in week three of phase three. And I hope you got... Uh, they're really shooting up there on that hill. I'm trying to end my video and they're interrupting me, blowing stuff up. So um, what I was saying was uh, I hope you understand how the war started and you understand that this war is going to become the bloodiest war in American history up until this point. 600,000 Americans are going to die as a result of the secession of the South. Until next time, see you guys later.